Okay, we have almost a full house. There are some seats here and there, but uh, let's let's get going. So, welcome to the Life in the Fast Lane Achieve Sustainable Growth. My name is Janne Kalliola, and I'm the host this afternoon or tonight. And with me there is Jeff Valpole from Phase 2, Paul Johnson from CTI Digital, Tim Deason, Deason Online, and Vesa Palm from Wunder Crowd. People that we together employ more than 450 people, so we know... We should know at least something about growth. So short, short introductions first. So as said, my name is Janne Kalliola. I'm CEO of Exove. We are 70 people, started in 2006 with one, people, one person, so we have grown quite a bit. And then off to panelists, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Jeff Walpole. I'm CEO at Phase 2 Technology in the U.S., um, Started in 2001 uh, with four people, and we now have 130. So 13 years um, we've been in business. Uh, we have headquarters in Washington, D.C., uh, offices in New York, San Francisco, and a uh, sizable office now in Portland, Oregon. Uh, hi, Vesa Palmo, uh, CEO of Wunderkraut. Uh, started uh, about five years ago. Uh, today we are more than 150 people uh, in Europe, uh, so pretty much all over Europe, officially headquartered in London, but we are quite distributed, really. Uh, I'm Tim Deason. I run an agency called Deason. Um, we're about 30 people based uh, in the UK. Um, we kind of, we've been a uh, Drupal agency since, since about 2007, and um, we've kind of concentrated on uh, full service to the, in the sense that we do user experience design, uh, strategy, as well as uh, Drupal services. So some clients use us for typical agency services and some use us for Drupal as well. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm a director at CTR Digital. Uh, we were founded 10 years ago. Um, uh, we're based in Manchester. We have offices in London and a developer down in Brighton now. Um, we have a CEO as a majority shareholder and five directors as a management team. Uh, we've grown for over 10 years from four people uh, to about 32 years ago, and now we're uh, touching 58 people. Okay, thank you. And uh, if you want to have questions in the middle of this session, then use hashtag Drupal Fast Lane all together, and I'll, I'll monitor with my, my fancy iPad here, and then maybe, uh, maybe in the questions here, and then... Later, you can have questions also by the mic. But let's get to the, uh, to the uh, discussion. So the first topic, we have three topics here. So first topic is why do we want to grow? That is the question. So uh, panelists in, uh, in uh, free-formed order, what is, the, what is the business reason why you want to grow or what was the defining moment you, you found out that you actually want to grow and why? So uh, I'm not actually sure I do. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, so um, <clears throat> so I think for for phase two, the the initial first five years of our company was very small. Um, we had no growth plans and no growth path, and I think it took a while for us to understand we were a business. Uh, and I think that's really the key defining point is once you realize that the point of a business is actually to make money. Um, you learn that by uh, figuring out that model and that engine and then scaling it appropriately, um, I think you you earn more profit uh, for your shareholders. So there's an economic reason. Um, the other part about it is just opportunity. Um, once you get good at doing something, I think you want to be able to replicate that and you hire people that take a lot of pride and enjoyment in delivering success and they want to do more. It's addictive. Um, I would also actually say be sure you want to grow because it's it's not something that, that you definitely need to do. Being a uh, small freelancer is a, is a pretty sweet place to be at, but you can't do all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and basically one of the primary reasons for growing is to be able to do different kinds of projects for different kinds of customers and, and go to places you wouldn't otherwise. Um, that said, it's it's a really like a balanced question on like do you want to grow and how big do you want to be because your your life and business changes quite a bit when you keep on growing. 
I think uh, certainly for me as a founder, it's been interesting to understand. I think why grow is a really important question when you're moving from being a freelancer or um, kind of as you go through those different points because your job will change if you're at the top of that kind of pyramid and understanding what you want to be doing day to day and why I think is quite important because otherwise you can end up with a business plan that doesn't really reflect the reality of what you want to achieve. Um, we've grown quite organically so we haven't had any acquisitions and I think it's been good because it's allowed us to align to opportunities well and certainly part of the driver of that has been to take on more kind of interesting opportunities or clients or skills that feels like we can do better and better work and kind of I think in line with that that's allowed us to keep optimizing the business to to work out kind of those blue chip clients so it's certainly something that we did badly and didn't really understand at the start and I think of as we've learned those from those mistakes to understand where you need that clarity it's been um, important to, to kind of get better and better at that. Yeah, I think um, the the reason that we've grown is partly that we've uh, won bigger and bigger projects as time has gone on and have realized that we're quite good at servicing these large clients. Uh, but in order to do that, we've had to uh, get subject matter experts in certain areas like scalability or migration or accessibility. Uh, and in order to, 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 to do that, you have to have a certain size uh, to be able to attract those um, you know, uh expensive um, specialists thank you let's do a quick quick gallop from the uh, from the audience so how many of you are working alone in a single man entity single woman entity less than five people or five five or less people less than 10 people less than 20 people less than 50 people Less than 100, more than 100, more than 1,000. <laughs> okay, so there is still, still a plenty of room to grow. Uh, good, so what's the benefit of growth or growing to, your, to the clients? What do clients get when you grow? So I think the client gets a lot. Um, this is definitely something that we... Uh, utilized to our advantage in the sales cycle. We talk to clients about the, like Paul said, the ability to bring specialists to the team that a smaller organization couldn't afford. Um, so we can take a, a full breadth uh, set of experiences from strategy and design through content strategy, UX, uh, development, you know, get into uh, deployment and DevOps and infrastructure and scalability and all that. So, so we can deliver a very broad set of services, and I think that's a great selling point for some clients. Um, however, uh, I think there's a point at which size becomes uh, – you hit a point of diminishing return. And so we try to uh, target ourselves and imagine ourselves fitting the sweet spot between um, – you know, I call it the, the Goldilocks strategy, right? So you had the three little bears, you know, and this one's – this bed's too small and this bed's too big and uh, three little bears. I'm mixing my – I think I'm mixing my uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> my fairy tales. But uh, uh, so, you know, the por I'll go with the porridge, right? The porridge was too hot. The porridge was too cold. This one's just right, right? So we see ourselves as being large enough to deliver all those services but not so large that we've reached, you know, uh, an Accenture, IBM – you know, we, one department doesn't talk to each other and we create bureaucracy sort of thing. So we're targeting that sweet spot for clients in between. Yeah, what we really, uh, the reason for, for founding Wundercrowd really was, was quite simple. It was customer demand. Um, so customers were really looking to, to get an uh, international vendor uh, who would be able to service them globally or, or European-wide or whatever it may be for, for different customers, but they wanted to have a vendor that is small and agile and flexible. Not a very easy thing to do, um, and, and very few companies have managed to do it. And, and that's one of the reasons why, why, why we ended up being what we are today, being like small and flexible and not even trying to be one of the elephants, uh, like IT elephants. Uh, we don't want to be an IBM, really. We want to be able to be flexible and move quick and, and change and do different stuff and also do stuff differently from, from time to time. Uh, so that, that really was, was the primary reason for, for getting started. Yeah, we've certainly been finding a sweet spot of where 
agent uh, clients have been either shortlisting or selecting us to pitch on this basis that we're not so big, we're not kind of a WPP group, tens of thousands of people agency, but we're not uh, too small an agency that they feel like the size of the project is a commercial risk for them based on our turnover. And I think part of that sweet spot has been around having those um, specialist services like user experience or content strategy or some of those things that smaller agencies can't have and it feels risky to the client for them to be brought in on a freelance basis but not be a huge agency um, that they start to feel like even as a, as a kind of a very large pharmaceutical client, for example, even at that size, that they're not really that valuable to them based on billions of billings. And I think within the kind of Drupal community and the agencies that are out there, there seems to be a kind of an emerging opportunity for kind of big enough to, to take on big jobs, but not so huge that they're, they're kind of those network agency size companies where clients are just really sick of kind of not having that customized service or people paying attention or high staff turnover. And we've certainly been winning business on the basis, I think, of being able to do full service on those jobs, but um, not be so big that they kind of feel impersonal even to a really large client. I suppose for CTI, um, one of the big things was that we needed to be uh, large enough to be able to service uh, organisations like the government, enterprise and um, large public sector bodies that, that they require a certain scale. Um, and that's partly through th uh, things like resilience, so it, you know, sickness, uh, absence. Um, we're also, um, more people means we've got better availability to resource so we can plan around their changing requirements. Uh, we can also achieve a higher velocity. That's not just because we've got more hands on deck. It can mean that we've got specialist uh, roles uh, so through the full project life cycle. So we, we have people who are um, satisfying the kind of client relationship and sales, and then we have people who specialise in planning, and then we've got uh, separate teams for development and then the support and in-life services. And that's been a really important thing for us to kind of segment those because uh, it... it um, we found the development team were being uh, pulled into support uh, aspects and being pulled off projects and now that we have these two two sort of like finite roles um yeah the, the, it's a much more um uh, productive environment okay so we <coughs> we talked a lot, lot about sweet spot so hands in the air question for the panelists that who is currently at the sweet spot below the sweet spot mm. Mm. Above the sweet spot, I mean, uh, uh, certainly in the northwest of the, of the UK, there are quite a few um, uh, examples of companies that have taken that bridge between 50 and 100, and we're kind of at 50-ish at the moment. And it's a very dangerous gap to take. You have to introduce uh, extra layers of, of management, and um, you become. Uh, 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 the profitability uh, sort of wanes during that period, and there have been plenty of uh, agencies who have, have folded during during that journey. So, I'd say we're at that sweet spot, about to take a, a, a leap of faith. Yeah, I, I, you always the challenges keep on changing when you grow. There's always the next thing, and, and people say, you know, it's difficult to go from ten to twenty, or you know, fifty to hundred, or whatever. It's difficult to go from one to two. Uh, it's 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 always just a different challenge on what you face. And in, in our case, for example, the challenge right now is like time zones. We, we get like, without doing any proper sales, we get like U.S. customers who want to come in and all of our staff is based in Europe, which is a massive challenge on how to manage that because, you know, we don't want to keep people working in the middle of the night. So there's always the next thing, whatever it may be. So it's a fleeting sweet spot then. Uh, really, really quick answers. This is important question, so a couple of words only and starting from Tim this time. And what's the value of the growth for the staff? Uh, I think learning opportunities probably, if you want two words, yeah. Yes. Bigger parties. <laughs> <laughs> Ability to specialize in something that you're really passionate about. I think those would all be mine. <laughs> All those are better for staff. <laughs> Excellent. And then the next topic that we know now that why we want to grow for the fleeting sweet spot. So the, uh, the next one is how do we grow? And uh, let's take a first the, uh, once again, hands in the air for the panelists that uh, did you, have you grown organically? All those that have grown organically, hands in the air. What's there will be more. You can, mix? Yeah, you can, you can answer uh, to the several. So... Have you uh, grown through mergers and acquisitions? Have you grown using extensively freelance networks? Yeah. Okay, we have one that used all the three. 
something else that I have missed. Okay, that was exhaustive then. Uh, so let's let's go to the planning question. That how do you plan growth, or do you do? Does it just happen that, it, that suddenly you found out that you are CEO <laughs> of 200 people company, or have you actually made a plan and followed it? So, so in our case, uh, we started to get real growth when we made a plan and followed it, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, we started a, a budgeting cycle, and the budgeting looks at headcount, and it looks at uh, profit margins, and it works backwards to try to make sure that we achieve a net profit. Uh, and then it essentially establishes a growth path based upon um, what we think we can sell. So it's a, it's a difficult problem. Um, obviously, you have to factor in what you can sell, uh, the size that you want to be, and what you, how you can recruit um, qualified people. And uh, so we, we did achieve this year our growth plan, and then at the end of the year, we seized an opportunity to uh, do another uh, small, uh, not acquisition technically, an, an aqua hire. Um, but uh, we, we, that was outside of our growth plan, but we looked at it as an advance against – better hiring decisions than we would have made next year. So we had an opportunity to get a really great team, and we took it at the end of the year, but it was when we were literally at, I think, almost exactly at the number. It was the literal number that we were supposed to be at for the end of the year. So we were there early, and then we said, ah, screw it. Let's just get another 14 and add it on. Um, so the plan is very helpful, but uh, you always have to, I guess, allow yourself the ability to deviate from the plan to – seize opportunity yeah it's good to have goals uh, we have rolling goals usually so it's not like an annual budgeting or planning cycle it's more like well this is what we are going to do next kind of thing uh, and and it's also like ongoing and rolling and kind of a moving target uh, you mostly grow sales first um, because of, of of the nature of the business you need to have the sales to support the growth um, and um, then for example, we are always hiring, like at any given time, if we find the right person, we always hire them, and then the sales follows also. So I would say sales first whenever possible, but if you find great people, their work will also, you know, follow those people. Um, I, acquisitions are, are tricky, but I guess that's a separate topic. I think there's certainly kind of an ongoing cycle mentality. You need to be, it's just as important to concentrate on your sales as your delivery and infrastructure. And classically, agencies struggle when they oversell but don't have the processes or people to keep delivering. And you can end up with quite kind of a, a turnover and headcount graph that will just keep dipping up and down unless you can understand as your headcount grows that your problems will keep changing in terms of management infrastructure or process. Um, you know, the sales stuff is, is a kind of a completely different problem, I think, too. Often agencies, smaller agencies, haven't had to have dedicated sales teams, and I've found sales teams and business development is quite a complex thing to manage compared to um, project delivery and other things which you have to do all the time, even as a kind of very small agency. And I think recognising those different challenges and managing them uh, specifically to their nature, so not trying to treat sales teams as development teams and et cetera, is quite important to understand and break up your business that way because it's easy to um, kind of fall into nasty traps that um, catch you out later. Um, I suppose uh, CTI, um, uh, some advice would be uh, make sure you're selling the right projects, know what you're good at, and don't necessarily go for every single opportunity that comes along. Um, we do have a long-term plan. Um, I think it's important that you have a management te team and also your staff bought into that plan um, so that it echoes throughout the business. And uh, two years ago, it's fair to say that um, that wasn't the case uh, in our company and uh, we shrank um, because some of the management team were trying to pull the business in a different direction and um, it had quite a negative impact. Um, and to resonate what uh, uh, Jeff has been saying, yeah, you need to kind of... Uh, yeah, always be appraising things and be opportunistic so that uh, may that be through hiring or there may be um, you know, the next big project that you think that you should go for because it's good for the long-term plan. Excellent. There's a question from the audience, so the, at least somebody's awake there. So the, uh, uh, there's a question that would it make sense for a small agency to hire a dedicated business development specialist to help with the growth? So what, what's your take on that? Um, only if you've got staff who can deliver what they can sell. 
It depends what you mean by business development specialist. If it's a salesperson, as it is in the UK, fine, do it. Uh, if it's really like developing your business, I wouldn't. Um, or be prepared to hand over your company and, and sell part of it and whatever you do. It has to be all or nothing kind of thing because companies need strong leadership. And, and if you try to like outsource that leadership, that's not going to go well. Excellent. Uh, so we have been talking about sales. So what is the, what is the uh, I guess that the improved sales is the key to growth that you get more money in. So how do you get the new clients or how do you evaluate the markets where you want to expand? <clears throat> sure. Um, yes, I think first and foremost, having market specialization or, or strategy to, to go after something specific is critical because if you can't be able to tell uh, your staff whether they're dedicated salespeople or not dedicated salespeople, if you can't point at a specific target and focus and say that's how and where we're going to grow and that's what the kind of work we're interested in doing, then you're essentially just taking what comes to you. And if you take what comes to you, you're, you're at the mercy of your inbound lead generation process. And that's demand that you don't control. And you don't want to be growing a business off of demand that you don't control because that can turn around on you. If you can say, hey, I'm only going to sell uh, you know, Drupal and I'm only going to do it in the UK and I'm only going to do it around projects that are uh, have a you know, philanthropic cause or something. And I'm making up a very specific niche. But um, if you can say that and you can hold to that and you can demonstrate that to your team and you put those growth goals in place as well and you say, and we're going to go from, you know, 1 million pounds to 4 million pounds doing it and here's the research and I know we can do it and then you go outwards, now you have a forward-looking, uh, you know, a not, not a passive sales strategy. You have, you know, a more offensive um, uh, that's offensive, not offensive, um, <clears throat> sales strategy. I'll, I'll just add a bit on top of that, uh, basically. So uh, whatever he said. And uh, um, also what I see in, in Drupal shops, we, we talk about acquisition quite a bit. And w what I see in most Drupal shops is like um, they are, first of all, they're kind of busy uh, running with the bicycle because they don't have time to learn to how to ride the bicycle, so they run with it instead. Um, and, and the second thing is like they don't get to do the stuff that they would like to do, like specialize in, in, a, in a niche and, and do some great stuff because they are so busy in, in cleaning up their messes because they sell whatever just to get the ne next paycheck. And that's a really, really like vicious circle to be in. So breaking out of, of that circle somehow and, and getting to the next level and decided, hey, look, you know, we don't have that many customers for some time, but at least now we are doing what we really want to do and what we are really good at. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be <laughs> tricky because, believe it or not, people need to have their paychecks in order to eat. So tricky. Uh, definitely one of the most important things we found is that kind of deal evaluation work. So we've got quite kind of a rigorous um, way of pulling apart both the client and the project of can it be successful, can we be successful with it, what is the commercial context, um, does the client even understand what they want to achieve, are they capable of achieving it, what are the kind of context of the business risks. So if you're building something that's going to be on kind of national television in a week and the client doesn't really seem what you, you know that they know what they're doing, you're never to be that flack and backlash is going to come at you even if you were really never going to kind of succeed and that's going to hurt your reputation, your profitability, you're going to spend a lot of management time kind of fighting around stuff that was just always a kind of a, an inevitable conclusion. So we've kind of got better and better at kind of turning down as much work as we um, take on and that's really let us focus on where we can really go and do an amazing job of something that leaves the schedules, the mindset, the people, the business development all of the processes there to kind of do a really good job of the things that can, we can succeed with. And sometimes that takes a bit of kind of, you know, um, kind of steel nerves really to kind of turn down things and you think, okay, well, the pipe island's not looking great. We don't have tons of stuff booked in, but really, and this is a blue chip kind of name or something, but actually we just think this isn't going to work. And there's, there's a UK... Um, PLC, who I won't name actually, but we went through a kind of a period of turning down work for them and saying, actually, we just don't understand these projects. We don't think this is going to work. And actually, they've we've been working with them, having seen those projects fails, fail with other people. We've now been working with them for a while, and we actually got credibility by pointing out the kind of flaws in their project process to then be invited back in outside of a tender just to be commissioned to do the work. So that was kind of gratifying, although nerve-wracking, um, for that kind of year in the middle. 
Yeah, I can only resonate that, that uh, there was work that we were uh, we won through the British Council and uh, there was a get-out clause after the discovery phase and uh, we, we, we um, ex- used that opportunity to say we could walk away um, because uh, the, the, the um, platform that we were going to develop upon was, uh, was not satisfactory. Uh, but the outcome of that was that um, we migrated them to Drupal 7. So uh, sometimes you need to be prepared to take a brave step and be confident about what you're doing. But um, with reference to sustainability, I'd just like to add that I think you should find work which your team enjoy or they find satisfying, um, but it should also be profitable. Um, and use that the profitability, uh, look to your previous projects and be honest with yourselves uh, about how they went. Um, and having satisfying work helps with retention of your staff. Uh, they're more likely to stay for a long time. Uh, but always seek out work which sort of um, complements to uh, your long-term goals that the management team have already established. Good. <clears throat> and then there's other question from the related to the markets from the, from the audience that the... Uh, what is the large enough uh, organization to serve the, the uh, government and the enterprise markets? Quick answers. This would depend a lot on a country. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is like, say, for example, in, in the UK, um, the, the government is actively trying to, say, use SMEs, like small and medium mm. players, uh, whereas in, in markets like say, Sweden or Finland or whatever, it's going to be like, if you don't have a million employees, you can't even bid for, for a major project. It really varies from country to country. In some places, you need to be one of the big four or five players in order to play. And, and in some, some markets, it's quite the opposite. So this is highly reliant where you're operating it. How do you get to learn that? By accident or by, by just trying? Or Well, you, you kind of know it uh, by talking to local vendors but I, I guess not many companies are trying to actively move to another market so you would know it for your own market probably uh, and, and I think that should be easy uh, for us it's we've always just spoken to the local players and, and know how it, is, how it is and it's easier to, to uh, determine that for the public stuff that's quite simple usually uh, for, for the private companies there may be very different uh, restrictions from size. There may be like language or cultural issues or you're not being German or you know whatever. <laughs> there you, you actually run into quite a few different uh, roadblocks when you're trying to go to, into a new market. Okay, and then the third section starts with the, the sustaining the growth. And let's talk about staff. We, we briefly touched the staff, but it's a really important important topic in the growth that you need to have people that you can grow so what is the what is the uh, importance or meaning for of the vision and the culture in your in your organization regarding growth let's start from from that side this time i i would say beyond um yeah what what well it kind of informs everything that you do um the, the way that you you conduct disciplinary uh, actions, yeah, if you've got issues with the developers, uh, what work you go to to, to win, um, h- how people interact with one another on a day to day basis, uh, the, the culture is is, is a, yeah, it's integral to the whole business. I can't really emphasise it enough, um, and and I think it's something that you need to have. Uh, clearly communicated because as you grow you're bringing people who perhaps don't um, n- yeah you need to make make sure they're aware of, of what it is that they're coming to um, um, so part of your recruitment process should actually uh, express uh, the type of organization that you are um, otherwise it's going to change and it might not be uh, in a manner which is is um, going to uh, contribute to your sustainability <coughs> Yeah, I certainly think the kind of clarity and communication are the two, the two kind of keys. That if you don't understand what you're going to do as a management team, um, then no one else will, for a fact either. And if you don't communicate that in a way, kind of regularly and often, then other people can't collaborate with you um, to kind of achieve those goals. And I think it's something, um, certainly I've underestimated in the past to kind of think, oh, well, isn't it obvious what we're doing? And actually, you know, to be fair, I don't think it often is. Um, you know, the at the kind of leadership level of a company, I think often you're kind of moving faster and looking at things in a way that um, not everyone else has the opportunity to. And I think it's really important to to kind of set those goals and then um, keep communicating them and collaborating on them and working through them. Um, 
otherwise people often you know change is something that humans just aren't geared up to kind of enjoy and accept without kind of having that um, context for it too and I think letting people know where you're going and why um, is really important and can often smooth over the kind of humps and bumps that you get with growth where things people's roles change people's processes change people's kind of working habits are going to change and that can often be um, more difficult than you anticipate I think in my experience uh, it's largely down to the culture culture it's strategy for breakfast uh, it doesn't make any difference what sort of strategy you have if your culture is conflicting with it. The culture is always going to win. So how do you how do you create the culture? Well, it's a living thing first of all. It's it's something that when the organization grows and changes, the culture keeps on changing. But you can you can do like cultural leadership as well, uh, mostly by doing the right thing and doing the stuff you believe in. And actually, your daily actions as a leader have to reflect your your values and your vision and your goals and all that. So you have to be like all the time walking to talk basically on, on a daily basis and leading from the front line really. Uh, so that's that's the only way I know how to how to create the great culture in a company. Problem with going last is you, you start to forget the question. <laughs> um, I think it was twofold. It was the impact of culture but also sort of sustained growth, right? And how those are related. Um, so I think first and foremost, you know, you can look at you can look at growth two ways. You can look at it as uh, responsive growth that's kind of pulled by demand. You know, uh, we got one or two large projects and they wanted us to scale up. So in response to that, we added people. Um, the the problems with that are similar to what I said earlier about sales in that um, that's someone else's plan for you, not your plan for yourself. That's being pulled in a direction by demand, not determining you're going to go in that direction proactively. And those are the situations that typically don't last. They're not sustainable growth because um, the company wasn't controlling that destiny. Um, and the second side of it, the other way to do it is, is really in, in more of a proactive uh, way. And that's the, what tends to be more lasting um, and more sustainable. And the reason is because you're focusing hopefully, and we haven't mentioned this yet, but you're hopefully focusing a lot more on scaling than growing, which is to say you actually understand the structure and the leverage that the organization needs with regards to management and certain skills and talents and resources to go to that next level and stay there and be there productively. And that's where management and leadership become a big deal because that's when you can actually say, hey, this is there, there is a mission there is a vision for this organization, there's a strategic plan, and there's culture. And all of those things are connected to each other, and it's done in a planned and organized way. Um, if you're growing in, in response to something, you don't have time to align your mission and your vision and your culture in a way that makes sense to those employees. So I think they are very related. It was a good question, even though I didn't remember it. <laughs> Okay, let's have a short wording from the from the audience. So, how many of you think that you know your company's vision by heart? Surprisingly many. How many of you think that you are working in a, in a growing company? Even bigger amount. And uh, how many of you think that the, the, the fleeting sweet spot is still ahead of you? But you still need to grow to be the sweet spot. How many think that you have grown already past the sweet spot? We have one guy. Okay, we'll, we'll need to talk with, with you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have been talking about structures and levels and the others. So what is the... What are the risks involved in when you, when you sort of step up the operations, when you, when you grow to the next level? What kind of things you need to be prepared for? Who wants to go first? Oof. Should we start down here? You, you choose. Actually. I'll go, just go down the line. All right. So I think there's uh, – the, the, we, we could do three hours on the topic alone. But um, I think first and foremost, uh, it, it, the part of the risk in growing is you start to lose the culture that you had before. Um, and I think, you know, like Vesa said, focusing on that culture as a primary thing has to be your job. Whoever is the CEO, your job is 
to ensure that that culture is not affected by your ambition for growth or your scaling plans. Um, I also think that um, you have to support, you have to start to think about the infrastructure that in the general sense that's required. Um, that infrastructure includes financial and legal uh, aspects, you know, making sure that you actually have the sophistication to do your, your, your numbers and, and run it like a business. Uh, it includes sales and marketing, making sure that you have the ability to sell more work in the future. Uh, it includes management of all forms, project management, product management, staff management. Any, you know, the, the, we all tend to think of management as overhead, but the reality is, is it's scaffolding for growth. It's the scaffolding that sits outside the organization and ensures that you can stack the next layer on top. And so creating a management structure that both enforces the things that you're doing strategically but isn't uh, a negative uh, impact on the culture is, is one of the hardest things you can possibly do, but it's the most critical. It is literally trying to build a building without understanding what that structure is. So, um, I think... Probably the biggest risk is uh, it becoming a job or just a job. So, so basically, it no longer it's something that you on Monday mornings you are really glad that yeah, it's great to go to, to work and do all of this great stuff because uh, you have all sorts of hassles and and you may have even a temptation on copying the big boys on how they run corporations because surely they know because they have tens of thousands of employees and you copy all of the bureaucracy and layers and all this like additional crap which part of it may be scaffolding like really for growth, part of it may be just because that's the way it's done because that's the way they teach you when you do MBAs, which is complete crap if you ask me. But, uh, so, so all of this may actually turn, turn it as a like work where it's like, oh my God, it's again Monday, I don't want to go to work and, and that's the biggest risk. I think it's really important to understand the business in terms of kind of turnover and headcount of what is just good business and that's nothing to do often with kind of being a Drupal agency or an agency or anything else. I think ensuring that you've got the right kind of uh, financial or professional advisors kind of proportionate to the work you're doing which may have been different when you were 10 people on a £50,000 deal compared to something that's on a quarter of a million deal, you can find yourself in traps that are far less intuitive, I think, um, as you start to work with larger and larger clients or on riskier projects. And I think kind of studying your business and studying businesses of the same size to understand um, what are the kind of some of the techniques, and it could be around tax, it could be around liability. There's lots of things that kind of keep shifting as you go through and, and ensuring that you're kind of paying attention outside of the, the kind of agency space because lots of these things apply to um, businesses of those size regardless of their type and not kind of getting too stuck into kind of the um, just what kind of goes around amongst your immediate peers or um, kind of people that you'd speak to anyway, but kind of studying it um, in a more wide sense I found useful. I think uh, one of the risks of uh, becoming quite large is that the uh, management team can become isolated from the production team, the people who are actually um, making these things. Um, the temptation to hire people just to satisfy a demand, uh, you hire in the wrong people, um, that can be a big risk. It can, uh, yeah, if you get one bad apple, it can spoil things. Um, it also has an increased need for better process and good documentation so that it is scalable. Uh, so that people know exactly what they're doing. And also uh, resource planning is quite a big um, issue with us. Uh, so uh, we have a, a, a manager who spends his whole time horizon gazing and speaking with sales and production uh, because the more projects you have um, the more li and the bigger clients uh, and the more likely there are shifts in um, the, the client requirement. Uh, projects may go away for a period of time leaving a big gap in your uh, you know, with guys with the tap in the bench and you have to, uh, to run a profitable business, uh, avoid that, that at all costs. So... <clears throat> Uh, Paul already mentioned, so we'll, we'll start with you uh, this time. That the, uh, about risks that you, you you mentioned that you had some 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 uh, bad bad things happening a couple of years ago. Mm. So have any risks realized, and how did you mitigate them? Um, I mean that that situation uh, is kind of concurrent with when I arrived. I was brought in to try and help to I, I shared the, the vision of the company. Um, and I suppose the, the CEO mitigated that by um, uh, finding ways for that ind those individuals to depart. Um, but 
a lot of the risk that we have is is around um, around resource. Um, we have a lot of staff. Um, it's a it's a hungry monster to feed. Um, so we have to ensure that uh, the sales pipeline is well well filled. We're looking into yeah the middle of next year to uh, ensure uh, it's all about planning. Um, so I, th I think uh, having it, uh, somebody who is not only the managing director of the company thinking about the finances and and, and that aspect, there's also the uh, the long term. Uh, resource planning that, that really has been fundamental to uh, us turning the company around. Okay, and uh, all the others can also share war, war stories now about the things that went wrong and so forth, if something went wrong. Uh, where do you start? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly we've seen risk, you know, I think risk can kind of come in many forms. Some of the risk we've seen has been from some of our biggest successes, I guess, when we've had really rapid growth periods and you are trying to kind of manage that growth and it feels good and you're succeeding but also you're growing kind of possibly quicker than that kind of scaffolding's going up and you have to we've had definitely had some kind of retrenching periods where we've just tried to to kind of take a little bit of a step back and make sure that where we've kind of achieved on that growth cur curve that's sustainable and we've been lucky to kind of had have permanent growth I guess so we've certainly kind of grown um, slower and smaller than other people um, but we've been lucky to be able to kind of maintain it and sustain it rather than um, kind of dipping up and down. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the keys, I think, is also just when, which sounds a bit kind of um, e or <laughs> um, negative, but when, thing, you know, when it, things are going really, really well, just understand what does that mean for the next thing. If you've just hired 10 people, don't forget to look at that pipeline that's three months out and six months out because all of that growth needs to be kind of sustained. Otherwise, you just deal with really, really irritating problems about kind of dipping up and down and having to bring people in and take people out. And that just takes a lot of energy and time, which would be better spent on kind of investing in the future, I think. We have a culture of celebrating failure. Um, other companies have employees of the month. We have the fail of the month. <laughs> so this may sound strange, but we really do uh, do focus on, like, if, if you fail on something and stuff goes wrong, uh, try to learn from it. Try to make it public because failures are not expensive. Hidden failures are expensive. Um, and uh, this leads to into sort of retrospective also. Uh, and, and the fun part being, like, all of the most expensive failures tend to be my failures always. So I get to do the really expensive uh, stuff. Uh, and there, there are so many uh, risks, and, and you can't avoid all of them. You just have to try to fail fast and fail cheap, basically, with those risks. Uh, most of the risks are, of course, around people, because the entire business is around people. So you may have co-founders who want to leave the company at some point because they don't feel like it's a company that they want to build anymore. Uh, you have to try to be civilized on, on how to deal with that. And, of course, you know, if people want to leave, they have to be able to leave on good terms. And, and yeah, so many stories around that when you do integration of companies. And, and we have, like, 17 uh, native languages spoken in a group. So cultural diversity is there. So, yeah, people. I saw a bunch of Wonder Crowd people celebrating at the bar last night. <laughs> I don't know if they, uh, I don't know what they failed on, but uh, <laughs> something, something went wrong. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I think there's two types of risks that as the leader of the organization you have to look out for. There's, uh, you know, like economics, there's micro risks, there are things you can control inside of your own environment, and that's mo what most of us probably have to spend most of our time on. And then there's the macro, the environmental risks that we sort of can maybe influence or we can kind of steer around, but it's like the weather. You can't, you can't control it. Um, you know, if, if Drupal disappeared off the face of the planet tomorrow, uh, you know, what would they do to our businesses? We, you know, we don't like to define ourselves as Drupal companies, but we're dependent on it, right? And so um, things like that are also scary. So the things that it's, it's disproportionate. I think the things that uh, a CEO probably stays awake at night thinking about are the things they can't control uh, disproportionately. And then the things that you can't control, you don't always do a good job with. So, you know, when it comes to the specific things, um, you know, I think our biggest failures were – our biggest failure came, you know, two, two three years ago when we – it was not really because of growth. It was because of not – understanding how quickly our organization moved, then how much we had to have a pulse on the numbers. 
and we didn't really have a good sense of our own numbers. We're much more data-driven now than we were a couple years ago, um, and you have to be. If the if you know if 10% growth is actually you know 15 people, um, then you know every hiring decision that you make there has to be driven by some further future planning. You know, it's really it's really important that you understand the pipeline, you understand the metrics, the profitability, your gross margin, you have to know what your expenses are, you have to know your cash and how much cash you have and how long you can go. And so those types of and then their operational metrics, your utilization, your effective rate, your you know, cost per employee, all of those things, um, the KPIs, the key key, you know, um, the, the key process uh, indicators that you want within your organization are probably for us the most important maturity point in the last year or two. And just really knowing those gives us confidence to grow because we can hopefully see any kind of issues coming a little bit further out in the future. Excellent. And then there's a one question from the audience that I brutally will, will uh, mangle a bit. So the, uh, the question is, the original question is, are larger customers better for growth than small customers, but my question related to that, that how has your clients changed when you have grown? Quick answers, and then we'll go to the last topic. Start here. Anyone? So, uh, yeah, as we've gotten bigger, our clients have gotten bigger, and uh, that's that has been a both reality that I think everybody will reflect, and also um, one of the reasons that we got bigger was to serve those larger clients. So it's it's by design as well as by effect. I don't really have anything to add. That's the case. Uh, we've definitely found larger clients to be uh, beneficial because you can sell multiple projects to them and that relationship is more valuable. Um, you think you have to recognize that the cost of sale goes up to larger clients. That initial kind of foot in the door stuff can take a lot longer and be a lot more time consuming than it can for smaller clients. Um, our clients have gone from uh, having s small enterprises that have strong owners and you've just got to convince that one person to CEOs, uh, maybe boards, that you have to go through a very bigger process and convince a lot more people and be more authoritative in how you're doing it. So it can be a lot longer process. You have to be very self-assured. Okay, and now listen carefully because now it's time for the key takeaway from the panel. So one sentence advice to the people that are thinking of growing, please. Uh, I would say the most important thing is, 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 well, it's cliche, world peace. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is, is the people you hire. Just make sure you don't lose track of, uh, what Vess or Tim or somebody said, uh, um, just each person that you add into that organization, while it, they may be small relative to the size you're growing to, they have the ability to either make you successful or start to hurt you. And so each person you bring in is critical to the success. Uh, I'll try to stick in one sentence <laughs> if I can. Uh, but, uh, don't forget why you do it. That was half my one, actually. I think be really clear what you want to achieve um, and why, because if you don't get those two, two things together, um, I think it can get quite complicated quickly. Um, have a long-term objective and take small steps to get there. Excellent. So now all of the audience are experts in growth. So the, uh, now it's time to go deeper. So any questions? So you can use the hashtag DrupalFastLane, and we won't answer them right now, but we won't kindly ask you to come to the microphone but uh, the the these guys have promised that they will they will uh, get back to you in twitter for those questions that i didn't ask now but we have now 12 minutes and counting for any questions that you might have please go to the mic you can form the line there if you like to. um what if sh should should the founder of the company presume the founder of your of your company is a developer uh, I'm not talking about myself here. Um, what and this developer says is very, very good. Should that person become the company leader like yourselves, or hire in a company leader, let's say, and remain as the top developer in the company? What do you want to do? <laughs> it depends on that, really. What do you want to do? If if you want to become a leader, become a leader. 
go and get trained up in business stuff. It's really not all that, that fancy. Just go and do an MBA or whatever. That's simple. Developers will be excellent, or technical people in general will be excellent leaders if they just get the experience and training. But if you, what, what you want to really do is hack Drupal, yeah, no, then, then you need to do that. So you wouldn't have a problem with the, the founder of the company being, let's say, lower in terms of the management scale? For the, for the uh, recording, that the question was that the, uh, whether the, uh, is it the problem that the founder of the company is below the management in the, in the bigger company? So, uh, so I think as you grow, so I actually have, uh, I have four original founders in addition, well, four original founders, then through acquisition, another founder, uh, then uh, we have an employee stock plan, and then we've been giving some stock to various management, and so we're starting to get to a point where we're more like a corporation and less like a firm that's controlled by a few owners, and we're encouraging that by drawing distinctions between those that own equity in the company and those that are officers acting on behalf of the company. And we think this is helping us professionalize. So we've brought in people from the outside, like my COO, for instance, who uh, who was not an equity o owner in the company but is a very experienced business executive. And we've taken a founder, in this case, one of my partners originally, and we have essentially put him underneath him. Uh, based on skill, and we think that when we, every time we do that, we're doing that for the employees. We're telling the company we will run this company as efficiently and effectively as we can, regardless of our ownership interests, and that's also in the interest of those people that own it because they get to watch professionals build build value for them that they would otherwise be trying to do themselves. So we're actually embracing the distinction between ownership and management in a very strong way. If, if I can add one more thing, uh, don't ever be worried on hiring more senior and smarter people than you are yeah. uh, because m most founders are actually afraid of that. It's like, what if I bring this person on board and they are smarter than me and more experienced and they're going to take over and... And your business grows. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Next question. Hi. Percentage-wise, what was your split between uh, uh, like developers sales personnel and project managers uh, when you were small and compared to now that you're big? I think we found we were developer heavy at the start because you don't have much process or infrastructure around that and then I think we're at the ratio of about a third developers and then the rest are support staff, creative, project managers, finance, things like that. So I think it the ratio does change and it's really important to understand your who's billable and who's not, because as you get bigger, there's be less in your ratios of who's actually um, charges rates will go down, which kind of shifts your um, numbers on your headcount quite quickly. Uh, I think it's natural to have a shift in, in the proportion. Oftentimes in a small company, people will wear several different hats. Um, so, uh, I mean, currently we've probably got about 60% developers. We've got, um, so it's 50, 50 odd staff. Uh, we've got um, four project managers. Um, to dedicated salespeople, uh, so we're very, very heavy on the dev still, but we've we've got um, uh, could, uh, could you repeat those numbers? So we've got fifty staff. Uh, we've got about fifty percent developers. We've got three or four um, project managers, and then we've got a, a management team of about five people, um, a very small design team, and then administrative staff on top of that. I mean, the developers are the fuel for your business. They're the, they're the guys that are earning money, so. I think, I think our stats are something, and don't quote me on the exacts, but so 130 people, uh, about 60 of them are just straight developers. Then we have our, like, UX, business analyst requirements, people, project managers, and all that. Sorry, that's, that's like, so like 70 developers. And then it's like 30 in those other categories. So when you add all that up, it's like of the 130, 100 of them are delivery staff. So billable, mm -hmm. you know, in some capacity, mm -hmm. 10 in sales, and then 20 in the rest of the, the business function. So mm -hmm. like 15 between sales and marketing, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the biggest change uh, we've seen is, is uh, we are more diverse now. So we are hiring more experts on, on say, UX or something like that. We, we haven't – well, our structure is a bit different. We don't have sales at all. Um, so that's, that's why the shift hasn't been so dramatic for us if, if I look at the numbers. And I don't have the numbers right now. I can't remember them. Uh, but it's it's also been you know more like specialists on staff. That's been definitely the biggest uh, change we've seen over the years. Can I just ask? Uh, did you say that you don't have any sales personnel, like pure sales? Well, we call our sales consultants, and they are billable. So that's the you can call them key account managers. They do the same job, but the difference is we actually bill their hours. Um, what's your vision in sustaining growth with multiple leaderships? And does it have a positive or a negative effect? Anyone? What do you mean by multiple leaderships? You mean if you have multiple people in the company having strong ideas or visions about the future? Well, um, I have some experience on, on bad and good examples of this. Uh, in, a, in a good, healthy relationship, you are uh, aligned um, of, and, and, you know, you complete some of your, your uh, you know, weaknesses and so on. Uh, in, a, in a bad relationship, you, you end up disagreeing on everything and you can't get anywhere because of that. And if you end up in the later situation, you, you know, somebody has to leave. Uh, if it's the first one, great. So it depends on, on the people quite a bit. Yeah. So you can uh, you you can, the what I said earlier about the ownership versus kind of officer thing is important here because um, you have to rein anybody in who's an owner who feels that they should be in any way driving things differently than your chief executive, right? So, and even if you're a five person company, you should have a CEO, and that CEO should be in charge. And the rest of the team is there to do certain parts of the business. The CEO is not supposed to run all aspects of the business. There's a delegation, and there's a a dividing up of roles and responsibilities that's critical to getting growth. Because if you've got even – you see this a lot in this community, in the Drupal community. You'll see the the two-owner shop, right? And the two-owner shop goes to about 15 people, maybe 20, right? And what happens is – you got you know one tech guy and one business guy or two tech guys with you know split up roles, and uh, if they are pulling in different directions equally, then it's impossible to move forward. They they have to either be 100 percent on the same page or they have to divide and conquer on what those roles are. And one of them is deciding strategy, and one of them is focused on the operational aspects or something like that. That works as you get a little bit bigger. You're going to want more of a CEO and then someone someone who handles marketing, someone who handles sales, someone's going to handle the operations, and those people need to have clear what we call swim lanes. You know, it's like the, you know exactly what who's swimming in what lane so they're not bumping into each other. Um, and the best tool I can use, I could recommend for that is a, is a RACI chart. If you're familiar with RACI, it's... Uh, it's an acronym. You can Google it. But um, it, 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 it's a great exercise to get people to focus on what value and what purpose they're doing for the organization and make sure that those all align with the vision and the strategy and they're not pulling away in different directions. So they're complementary. Exactly. <clears throat> Next question. Speak Hi. close to the microphone. Hi there. Um, so you talk specifically about how important culture is, and I'm curious, as you've grown – you know, what you've done to be intentional about preserving culture, if that's been sort of top-down leadership, you know, or if that comes from within your organization or how you've, how you've made that work. And, and in, given how important that it is, you know, what steps as, as CEOs you've taken to, to um, sustain that as you've, as you've grown and be intentional about it? Uh, we could do a really long answer to this one, uh, but the very short version, because we, I think we are a bit short on time, would be just uh, set an example and be consistent on that. Sure. I think it's important to remember, too, is you're going to have a culture regardless of whether you're mindful of it and uh, kind of understanding what, what you're trying to kind of cultivate and, and how and having kind of a finger on the pulse as you go is really important. Um. And I think it's important to know what your culture is. Um, to emit that externally so that you can attract people who are like-minded so that you can grow that. Excellent. And then the last question. 
Hi. Um, I have a question regarding growth. We've been talking about that we need to like have good employees and find good employees. If you, what would be your advice when you have a company of the size 15 to 25? Before we can hire as somebody to take care of finding employees, um, somebody has to find the employee, and then often the CEO of the company or who is in the top position in the company. How much time would you say that you have to spend on finding good employees so your company can have a good growth? Well, I think it's the most important thing you can do because a bad hire will cost you time, goodwill. It, it's really kind of toxic. So I've always kept quite close to that process in terms of the kind of the final parts of it to make sure that we don't have people that, you know, it's not going to work out for either party. They're going to be unhappy and want to leave and they're not going to be kind of good for the business. So it's something... I think you want to kind of make as efficient as you can, but um, never lose sight of how critical it is in a service business um, because it's, it sets the tone for everything. And the way we do uh, hiring is um, we first, ha first have the local uh, managing director for a country being as a filter. So they spend a fair amount of their, their time like filtering the candidates after, after an assistant has such dropped really bad applicants, uh, to be honest. Uh, and uh, the last step actually is a team interview. So the team who actually will end up working with the person makes the final decision. So the say is not the manager or the CEO or anyone else, it's the team. And that helps quite a bit because it's a nice and honest discussion between like what the company is like and making sure that because the team has to survive with that person as well. So that's sort of, it's going to make your life a bit easier if you're running a company as well. I mean, as a company, we spend quite a bit of time doing it because if we don't do it right, then we're going to spend even more time because it's going to have to be done again. So... Yeah, so I think the point, the size point that you mentioned is di particularly difficult, and I do remember being at that point. We we did it somewhere around 40, get our own dedicated uh, person focused on recruiting, and that made a huge difference. Uh, we did dabble with staffing agencies and things. I mean, we worked with them for a while, but it's it's a difficult – I don't want to go in here and all the reasons why it's hard. But um, – I think that one of the most effective things you can do, my best advice for you would be um, get your core team together, have them brainstorm good, strong people that they've worked with before and have a really strong understanding what you need and see if there are any matches. And if you get even one really great person that someone worked with before who just comes in and adds a ton to your, your culture and your ideas and your growth – that will spiral out. And so it's a network effect of really it's, – it's basically a network effect of good people. And so I think if you can brainstorm people that you can bring into the organization that are referrals, people that some all of you have worked with that you trust, um, that will get you really far. Excellent. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Don't you leave yet, I have two topics. <laughs> so, first and foremost, give feedback. This is important. This is the only way that we can improve. And the other one, the even more important thing, that the discussion continues at quarter to four at the uh, G111 room, ADX room. There's a both business track, both growing Drupal business. So, squeeze in there to continue the discussion. Thank you.